Hello, everybody. I'm Tom from Protect the Porkies. Today, we're going to be talking about the newest plans of the proposed Copperwood Mine, which is currently seeking a permit from the state of Michigan to install exhaust vents, which would spew quite a variety of toxic contaminants into the air around Porcupine Mountain State Park, the North Country Trail, and Lake Superior. This map is just to remind us where the area in question is, right next to the western portion of the Porkies. Reminder that the Porcupine Mountains are not just any state park. They were recently ranked as the most beautiful state park in America. This is the largest old growth forest in mainland Michigan. It's the largest designated wilderness area in mainland Michigan. It is a truly special place. We're also dealing with the North Country Trail, which runs a literal stone's throw from proposed mining infrastructure. And the North Country Trail, it's truly an honor to have it in this neck of the woods because it's the longest of all national hiking trails. It stretches nearly 5,000 miles from North Dakota to Vermont. Now, this is what is currently being requested from this permit. They want to install a mine exhaust vent around about 200 feet from the state park. Another mine exhaust vent would be less than one mile from Lake Superior. And unrelated to the permit, but very clear on this map, is that the proposed waste facility, which would contain over 30 million tons of mine waste uh, with toxins such as arsenic and mercury and cadmium, would be less than 100 feet from the state park. So what exactly are the sources of these emissions? Let's take a look at one of the documents related to the permit, emission unit summary table. And here we see what are the actual sources of the emissions in question. Um, mine vents to exhaust emissions produced by underground mine heaters, propane, natural gas, drilling, blasting, continuous mining, excavation, travel, rock breaker, and transfer activities. Then we have mentions of propane heaters, natural gas heaters. Fugitive emissions is a big one. You'll often hear reference to fugitive emissions or fugitive dust, which basically means any machinery coming out of the underground chamber, which then comes above ground and carries dust with it. And that dust um, is difficult to account for. It can catch on the wind and spread elsewhere. So they take steps in order to control it, but fugitives will be fugitives and sometimes they escape. We've also got ex fumes coming from handling of concentrate, uh, indoor chemical reagent mixing, more fugitive emissions from outdoor stockpile, fugitive emissions from tailings disposal facility, fugitive emissions from vehicle traffic, a wide variety of generator, generators, diesel generators, natural gas, internal combustion engines, et cetera, all the way down to sewage treatment systems. So these are the sources of emissions that would be all within a literal stone's throw of the North Country Trail and Porcupine Mountain State Park. And here are some of the toxic compounds. These are TACs, which means uh, toxic air contaminants, which are expected to be emitted. These include compounds like arsenic, benzene, cadmium, copper, cobalt, formaldehyde, manganese, and there are quite a few more. This is just a partial list. There's that map again. Moving on, our objectives with this meeting and with our opposition to the exhaust permit is to use the exhaust permit application as an opportunity to educate ourselves on the impacts of mining, participate in the process, build momentum, demonstrate the scale of public opposition, and introduce new concepts into the regulatory conversation. Objective number two, defeat the permit. Let's read the fine print. The success of objective number two has no bearing on the success of objective number one. So 
this permit, uh, an air permit, is considered to be a minor permit by Michigan's regulatory agency, and the language is highly technical. They typically only receive engagement from experts who can speak a highly technical jargon. But our goal here is really just to engage the public and to inspire ourselves to participate in the process and build momentum. Some important dates. November 13th is when your written comments are due to this absurdly long and complicated email address. October 30th is when you'll have the chance to deliver spoken comments at the virtual hearing. And we strongly encourage out-of-state residents to participate. The Porcupine Mountains and the North Country Trail in Lake Superior do not belong to Michigan. These are places with tremendous collective value, and that's why we ask that absolutely everyone participate. The easiest way to find information about how to submit those comments is if you go to the website, protecttheporkies.com, go down to urgent actions. This first one here is all about the air permit. Click for details, you'll see that map again, and then these give you the exact steps. Copy paste that email address and click to register for the hearing. So moving on. These are the rules that Agle will consider when they listen to our comments or read our comments. They can consider technical mistakes in the review. They can consider grammar and spelling mistakes because that's extremely important. Uh, other rules the action should consider and why and why the action will not follow the rules. So we can actually propose new rules. Things they say they can't consider, air, land, or water issues not part of the project. They can't consider indoor air pollution or traffic or noise and lights or zoning issues or anything unrelated to the project. Um, it would be very easy to make the case that not being able to consider traffic or noise and lights is really not fair when you're talking about a place people go to specifically to escape these influences. So our mindset as we go into crafting our comments and submitting our comments, this is what I have proposed for myself. You can adapt this to your own liking or reject it completely. But air permits are highly technical and do not typically result in much public engagement. Thus, a large turnout will deliver a powerful message to AGLE. Michigan's Environmental Regulatory Agency. Regardless of the fate of this particular permit, every act of resistance contributes to momentum, which eventually leads to real results. Agle imposes very specific rules on the kinds of comments which may be considered, thus restricting the process to experts who speak a specialized language. By confining ourselves to these rules, we not only limit turnout, turnout but we normalize and perpetuate a faulty system. Therefore, our campaign advocates playing by our own rules. More participation is better, regardless of your expertise. Feel free to speak from the heart, even if it is not technically relevant. Only by daring to open the conversation do we unpave the way for a more just process. So rather than being anxious that we don't know enough to submit comments, just ignore that. Participate in the process and only by creating new rules and following the rules as we believe they should be, will the system as it is today have the chance to adapt and grow and evolve into something better. If we only play by their rules, we're just continuing the same system. All right, so back to air quality. Let's put this in a larger context. This is a study that came out in 2018 showing that lead emissions from ancient Roman mines traveled all the way to Greenland and can now be studied in ice core samples. So that's a distance of 2,800 miles. Lead emissions traveled nearly 3,000 miles from ancient Rome to Greenland. And now they study them in the ice core and they can track the rise and fall of ancient civilizations. They can see the presence of wars and plagues, et cetera, which led to a reduction in mining activities. So the question being, if lead emissions traveled nearly 3,000 miles, what about 200 feet to the old growth forest in the state park? What about one mile 
to Lake Superior. Seems like a no-brainer. So here are a list of a, a handful of reasons to reject the permit to install, which is the technical name for the exhaust permit. You might want to get out a pen and paper, take some ideas down. Maybe these will inspire completely different ideas. Maybe you'll have questions to investigate later. This is really just food for thought for you to interpret as you like. So reason number one, this is a place we come specifically for the air, right? Porcupine Mountain State Park, the North Country Trail, the shore of Lake Superior. This is not just anywhere. This is a place we come specifically for the air. This area is of special value, both to human visitors and to the permanent residents of some of the last old growth forest in the Midwest. But Agel applies a one size fits all template to permitting, which allows for no nuance in considering the unique characteristics of a place. Therefore, we demand the company should be required to resubmit an application which includes a comprehensive analysis of impacts to ecology and outdoor recreation. Let's take a look at the permit application that they've submitted. It is uh, 316 pages. So we would expect there to be some mention of, for example, Lake Superior. What, what are the potential impacts of all of this exhaust on Lake Superior? Do we find any discussion in 316 pages? No, all we see is Lake Superior on a map. There is actually zero discussion of impacts on Lake Superior. What about the Porcupine Mountains and the State Park? Do they mention impacts to the largest wilderness area in mainland Michigan? Most beautiful state park in the country? Actually, we get zero discussion of impacts to the state park. All we have, the only mention in text of the state park is um, the state park provides the project a natural barrier around most of the site to restrict public access. So that's the discussion of the state park is as a sort of unpaid security system, which will keep people from nosing around where they shouldn't be nosing. What about the North Country Trail? Surely that's been mentioned. Um, but actually the North Country Trail, a mere 500 feet from that massive tailings facility, doesn't even appear on the map. So no mention whatsoever of the North Country Trail. That's why we return to our point. They're approaching this project as though it exists in a void, in a vacuum with nothing around it, as opposed to at the juncture of all of these places that humans love to visit and that are of unique ecological importance. Reason number two, baseline data comes from an inappropriate proxy. That sounds complicated, but we're gonna to dissect that a bit. So the proposed mine site is located in a pristine area with zero industrial development. Apart from minimal traffic to the state park, there are no sources of emissions. But since there is no air monitor point installed here, baseline data has been collected from elsewhere. Firstly, from the Forest County Potawatomi Reservation which their own website states that while the quality of the air shed over the reservation lands has been considered pristine, pollutants from industry in more populated areas located upwind travel and have been picked up in data collected at the air site. And secondly, from the Oricon Wildlife Refuge, more baseline data has been collected. Um, let's look at both of these places now. So firstly, here is the, the proposed mine site would be right here in a place with zero human development. There is no power grid, there's no cell infrastructure. The roads are not in place to support heavy mining traffic. There are almost no permanent human residents here except for perhaps a couple off-grid folks. Meanwhile, this is where they are collecting baseline data from. The Horicon National Wildlife Refuge looks like a pretty wild place when you're zoomed in. But as we start to zoom out, what do we see? It's actually surrounded on all sides by chemical monoculture agriculture. We, we know that uh, emissions travel on the wind. If they could reach Greenland from Rome, 
they're certainly reaching the wildlife refuge from all of this agriculture, from all of this tangle of highways. We zoom out a bit more, what do we see? We're only 50 miles from Milwaukee with a population of over half a million people. So again, go a, a couple hundred miles north. Is that place right next to Milwaukee comparable to this area, which is 20 miles from the closest town of Wakefield with only, you know, 1,500 residents? So returning to this point, the Horicon Wildlife Refuge is surrounded by highways, chemical intensive monoculture, 50 miles from Milwaukee. We should demand that the applicant be required to install an air monitor point at the proposed site, right there next to the Porcupine Mountains and Lake Superior, and collect real baseline data before reapplying for the permit. Before we move on, let's talk about the importance of accurate baseline data, because this might not be a, a term or concept that you're familiar with. So let's take, for example, that um, we're trying to study what is the naturally occurring level of um, copper in the air where we are, or maybe not naturally occurring, but just what is the baseline value of copper content in the air? And let's say that number is one right next to the porcupine mountains. Could be one microgram, one milligram, one uh, one percent of one microgram. We're just gonna go with the number one for the sake of simplicity. So that's the real value. But we, because we collected baseline data from hundreds of miles to the south, 50 miles from Milwaukee, we're actually using five as the baseline value. Maybe that's not a big deal. But then when we're doing our environmental contaminant projection, and we say, oh, um, this is only gonna raise the value to six. If we're comparing that to our baseline value, it's only a 20% increase. So it might not seem like a very big increase, but if we're using the real baseline, which we didn't bother to measure, it's a 500% increase. And that's just when we're talking about our projections that we've modeled, pure speculation for the sake of permitting. That's a point we'll return to. The real, the real level of that contaminant is likely to be much higher, in which case the discrepancy between the proxy uh, of a two times increase compared to a 10 times increase is even higher. So that's why baseline data is important. And let's continue with that analysis when we talk about the baseline data for particulate matter 2.5 which will come from a separate monitor. There's currently no monitor for this in Gogibic County and particulate matter 2.5 is a particularly toxic kind of exhaust. Let's take a look at where they are collecting that data from. So again, zoomed in here, looks pretty good. Looks like a pretty pristine area. Just a bit of zooming out, what do we see? We are within a quarter mile of a septic treatment plant, within a quarter mile of a power generation station, within a quarter mile of a railroad terminal. Zoom out a bit more. Okay, we are actually right next to uh, Nagani. And this is in Marquette County near one of the most heavily trafficked stretches of highway in the entire Western Upper Peninsula. Zoom out a bit more, there, there's already you know, mining fallout, not that far away. So is this a comparable area for studying particulate matter 2.5 baseline compared to this? I think it's pretty clear it's not an appropriate proxy. And in the background here, we see a reishi mushroom, which grows exclusively on the Eastern hemlocks. The porkies are the largest old growth Eastern hemlock forest remaining in the country. And thus, thus one of the finest sources of reishi mushrooms. Reishi mushrooms are referred to as the mushroom of immortality in Japanese and Chinese traditional medicine because they have uh, very powerful medicinal properties. Unfortunately, they are bioaccumulators of heavy metal toxins, exactly the sort which would be emitted from the proposed exhaust vents. So 
we should demand that the applicant be required to install or use an air monitor point in a comparably pristine environment as a source of particulate matter 2.5 baseline data. Point number four, the authors of the application have been discredited. So the authors of the application were not the mining company. They have contracted that work out to an entity called Foth Infrastructure. Unfortunately, Foth's record on environmental contaminant modeling has been tarnished in at least two cases. Firstly, in the case of the Flambeau mine in which they were wildly inaccurate on multiple counts. And secondly, in the case of the proposed Back 40 mine in which a lawsuit showed them being perhaps intentionally deceptive. So let's take a look first at the proposed flam sorry, the, the real Flambeau mine. Uh, this comes from a document related to the proposed Back 40 mine, which does not exist. This is a very helpful document. But the Back 40 mine and the Flambeau mine all use the same environmental contractor, Foth Infrastructure. And in the case of Flambeau mine, let's just read this intro paragraph. A mining company and its consultants can develop outcome-oriented predictions during the permitting stage to, quote, predict minimal impacts. In fact, it is the mining company's interest to have lower predictive modeling. As we see firsthand from hard data, Foth, which is Copperwood's same environmental consultant, was drastically off in their predicted levels at the Flambeau mine. So here in this table below, we see the Flambeau mine baseline. For example, with copper, 11 micrograms per liter. Foth, when they needed their permits, they predicted they would only result in 14 micrograms. However, the actual result was 810. So that's a 50 times higher, 58 times higher than what they predicted for the sake of acquiring that permit. Same thing with iron, 47 times higher than they predicted. Manganese, 76 times higher than they predicted. Sulfate contamination was twice as high as they predicted. And these are not just numbers on paper. Um, that actually had uh, significant environmental impacts. The Stream C was officially added to the EPA's list of impaired waters due to high levels of copper and zinc. Their copper predictions were way off, 50 times, 58 times inaccurate. And what actually led to Stream C being compromised was not just water can contamination, it was the fugitive dust, which we talked about. It was the fugitive dust coming from trucks and other machinery, which caught on the wind and then went into the stream either from precipitation or from being blown in by the wind and that just really shows that there is no difference between air contamination and water contamination because nature doesn't divide itself that way everything is connected stream c is now an impaired water and the flambeau mine is used by the mining industry as an example of how metallic sulfide mining can be done cleanly so these are the same folks. In the case of um, the proposed Back 40 mine, there was a lawsuit related to a, a wetlands permit that they were requesting. And I just want to read some text related to what was stated in that lawsuit. Judge Poulter, the administrative law judge in a wetlands lawsuit case against the mining company, concluded that as a matter of fact, the company's computer groundwater model does not provide a reliable identification of wetland impacts, particularly those related to groundwater drawdown due to pit dewatering. So this is what the judge stated about the model of wetland impacts. It was not reliable. That model came from Foth, the same environmental consultant who is working with Highland Copper on this air permit. The trial testimony from Eric Chatterson, the geology special specialist within the groundwater permits unit from Eagle's Water Resources Division, was highly critical of Foth's faulty computer model. He stated that the model wasn't really built to answer, as far as I could tell, any questions about the wetland. He stated that Foth predetermined what was going to happen 
and it just manipulated the mathematics to make that happen. In other words, Foth's wetland analysis was a deliberate fraud with no credible science to support their conclusion about harm to wetlands. So they saw that to obtain the permit, the, the permit they needed to acquire a specific value. So they simply invented modeling to meet that value with no basis in reality. That is Foth infrastructure. They are working with Highland Copper for every single one of their environmental permits. In this case, it happens to be the air exhaust permit. Is this really an entity to be trusted with the environmental modeling for the closest metallic sulfide mine to Lake Superior in history, right next to mainland Michigan's largest old growth forest? We should demand that the company resubmit an application authored by an environmental contractor, which does not have a record of incompetence and dishonesty. Moving on, noise and light impacts must be considered. Even though Agle says uh, we can't use them when we're deciding whether to accept or reject a permit, this proposed mine does not exist in a vacuum. It comes it is in a place where people come specifically to escape noise and light. However, uh, Agle doesn't require noise and light permits. They don't even have such a concept in the context of mining. So if we can't talk about these issues now, then when can we talk about them? The impact of noise and light from the air exhaust vents is not irrelevant in a place people come specifically for the sake of finding peace and quiet and unbleached night skies, nor is it irrelevant to the mating and communication of birds and insects and the health of the incredibly scarce resource that is old growth forest. So let's take a look at a mine vent here. This is in um, the operating Eagle Mine in Marquette County. And as you can hear, it isn't silent. That din you hear in the background is a low drone that can be heard for miles away, at least three or four miles away, you can hear that drone. And we're talking about potentially installing something similar 200 feet from the state park. Not only will that be disruptive to humans, but here is some data showing the impact of noise pollution on bird species. Um, we see on the x-axis the volume of the noise in question, and on the y-axis we see the density of birds in that area even more pronounced than in grassland birds, in woodland birds, once the volume reaches a certain decibel, we see a drop off in population. The birds can't hear each other for the sake of communication and mating and territory, so they decide to go elsewhere. You know, I would do the same thing if it were me. So we should demand that Eagle recognize the unique needs of both outdoor recreation areas and sensitive old growth ecosystems. This permit must require the modeling and minimization of noise and light impacts. They say we can propose new rules for them to consider. We should propose that this rule be considered in the case of a beloved outdoor recreation and a unique ecosystem area. Number six, the mine is just the start of long-term air impacts. So this one's a bit non-linear, but hang with me. So this permit is a stepping stone in a path which leads to the actual manifestation of the Copperwood mine. If allowed to advance, Copperwood would require a 25 mile rollout of the power grid. After the mine boards up shop in 10.7 years, the power grid will not evaporate but instead will lay the foundation for ongoing industrial activity and thus significant air quality impacts for decades and centuries to come. So even though this seems like just an air permit, maybe they get it and, you know, uh, they don't even have the money to move forward. But then if they get this permit and they show it to investors and they get their next permit and they get some more money, it was a stepping stone which led to the mine being developed, which then requires the rollout of that power grid. Once the power grid is there, other businesses can set up shop. Maybe they're gonna want some temporary employee housing. Maybe they're gonna want a, a bar nearby, a gas station. Once that stuff's in place, other businesses will see it as a great place to set up some sort of development with cheap real estate. And then you have a variety of new sources 
of air impacts, which had nothing to do with the original permit. So we need to demand that Eagle's permitting paradigm account for long-term air quality impacts beyond the mine life, but still resulting from mining infrastructure like the power grid, as well as account for activities such as clear cutting and wetland destruction, which have a subtractive impact on air quality. So even without this permit, the mining company has already uh, drastically degraded the quality of air in the immediate area by destroying wetlands and destroying forests, which naturally filter the air. But they didn't have to get an air permit for any of that. So this just shows the uh, lack of a comprehensive understanding in the current permitting process. Everything is dissected into tiny parts and the connections between different phenomenon are lost. So that idea of the power grid leading to more development beyond just the mine is an example of shifting baseline syndrome, which is a concept we should all be familiar with. This is like maybe your great grandmother lived next to a forest, but your grandmother lived next to a farm field and now you live next to a parking lot. It happens slowly and most of us don't live long enough to track it, although it's happening uh, increasingly rapidly. Um, but it describes absolutely everything. So it, folks say, oh, it'll never happen that the area around the Porkies will be developed. For evidence, just look out your window. This is the story absolutely everywhere. Here's another example of shifting baseline syndrome, which I found comical. We'll see if that proves to be true or not. The first two are definitely already true. The third remains to be seen. All right, so in summary, no matter who you are or where you live, please submit written comments due November 13th and spoken comments October 30th opposing the permit. October 30th, you may note, is just a day before Halloween. This is going to be a virtual event in which our video feeds will not be active, even though the regulators get their video active and... Uh, if the mining company wants a representative there, we get to see their handsome faces, but we ourselves don't get to show our faces. So we might use this as a chance to have a Halloween celebration and even declare that we are in costume. Uh, maybe when you give your comment, maybe you say, I am currently dressed as a birch tree or an eagle or a lichen or any aspect of nature, which is a denied a voice in this process. It could actually be... Uh, you know, both a comical and a powerful statement. Because we aren't just here for humans, right? We're here for all of those entities that are denied participation in the process. And please craft your comments according, not just to what is legal, but according to what is true. If you are an air quality expert, by all means, go deep with the technical jargon. But if you're just a normal person like me, then write or speak whatever makes sense to you as long as it is true. And just to get a bit cosmic here, I wanna introduce the concept of karma yoga because it is very helpful in any sort of environmental activism or in life in general. This is a scene which comes from the Bhag Bhagavad Gita, which is a sacred text from Hinduism. Um, and the idea of karma yoga is that you perform all your actions with the mindset of duty and detachment. Do not be attached to the actions you perform and do not expect the fruit of your actions. In other words, we're doing this out of a sense of duty. It doesn't matter if the permit is accepted or rejected um, because if we focus on only the goal, that's gonna lead to us getting frustrated when we don't achieve that goal. And when we get frustrated, we give up. Even though this is just a stepping stone, right? We might get discouraged. We don't get the outcome we, write, we, we, we want. So instead of that, let's practice karma yoga and let's uh, submit these comments, not because we're expecting to win, but because it, we know it's the right thing to do. And this old growth hemlock tree communicates all of that with far fewer words. Like any tree, it is reaching for the sun, but it never obtains the sun, right? But through its striving, it grows tall. So that's the idea here is it's not about the goal. It's about the process. It's about doing what we know is right. 
So thank you everybody for tuning in. If you have any other ideas or feedback, please reach out to protecttheporkies at gmail.com and you'll find more information at protecttheporkies.com.